This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. I wanted to start today's show by thanking my many listeners and supporters for your patience over the past several months. I have been traveling, speaking, and meeting with people all across the nation. And that traveling and speaking and meeting is about to become even more extensive in the coming months. The good news is that my team and I have purchased portable equipment that should be able to provide something close to studio quality results while I am traveling over the next several months through the West Coast, the Eastern Seaboard, Italy, Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, London, Oxford, and other places. Well, for instance, today I am coming from Charleston, South Carolina, and the quality is pretty good. And we will have some very exciting news coming up very soon about our next few conferences this winter. So, this means that you will be hearing quite a bit more of me, hopefully five days a week, and if not, then at least three or four times a week at public occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And we do covet your financial material support at Sovereign Nations as we continue to lead the conversations about what is happening around us today. Now, this being said, I just finished participating in Charlie Kirk's Turning Point USA's Defeating the Great Reset Conference, and I was honored to speak at the conference, as was my friend and colleague, Dr. James Lindsay. My focus was primarily on the Great Reset's implications for religion, and it is the primary reason that most of this mess is happening in Christianity and every other religion in the world. But I do want to make one thing very clear. If we are to defeat the Great Reset, the World Economic Forum must be dissolved. It must be broken up, and everyone and anyone who is beholden to the World Economic Forum must be held accountable for their participation in attempting to transition the world into this sick, twisted, transhuman, and viral communist neo-fascist new form of government. That means every government official, every corporate partner, every financial partner, and every religious partner of the World Economic Forum must be held accountable. Because if you want to stop the Great Reset, if you want to stop the disrupting and dismantling of Western civilization, if you want to stop the spread of critical race theory and social-emotional learning in our schools and institutions of higher learning, if you want to end the cabal that is incentivizing corrupt men like Rick Warren, Ed Stetzer, Tim Keller, Al Mohler, Danny Aiken, Legan Duncan, and others as they infuse Christianity with a critical consciousness... If you want to stop the push to drive our U.S. currency into central bank digital currencies, if you want to end the push to overturn our current cultural hegemonies by making every issue about race, gender, and equity, if you want to end the movement to change our crippled health care industry that was already crippled by Obamacare and change it into medical Marxism through health equity, If you want to end the attempt to control free speech, if you want to end the giant move to end volitionally controlled human driving, if you want to preserve the national sovereignty of the United States of America, if you want to end the sick movement to perform sex reassignment surgery on children, if you want to ensure that free and private farmers can continue to grow and distribute food as we have always been able to in Western civilization. If you want to ensure that we keep our supply of oil and gas going, if you want liberty and freedom of conscience, then we must end the World Economic Forum. And we must end it now. Because just as Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum has penetrated the cabinets, Klaus Schwab in the World Economic Forum has penetrated the Christian denominations and world faiths. He has penetrated education. He has penetrated the corporations through BlackRock and Vanguard. He has penetrated the energy suppliers. He has penetrated the farming and food production industries. And it is all happening everywhere in everything at the same time. 
So to defeat the Great Reset, we must end the World Economic Forum and all of its well-strategized attacks on sovereign nations, faiths, and capitalism throughout the world. You see, five years ago, we decided to begin the organization known as Sovereign Nations because I knew that the primary threat that we as Americans and as well everyone in Western civilization faced was a threat to both our national sovereignty and to our personal sovereignty. Our sovereignty as a nation of men and women, as families to live as we please, to work as we please, to think as we please, to worship as we please, without any government or any other king or ruler imposing their will upon us, was it threat. And it was at threat from the World Economic Forum, China, the United Nations, and from other NGOs. The first and foremost would be Open Societies Foundations. And so we form sovereign nations. Because sovereignty is at stake. Now, when we speak about the Great Reset, and we've been talking about the Great Reset since 2018, remember that the Great Reset is at its heart a program for driving political power away from individual citizens and towards the controlling interests of a small international class of financial elites. Now, in many ways, it was seen this way starting in about 2009, with Richard Florida's publication of The Great Reset. Yes, Richard Florida. But this shift in society's balance of power has fundamentally changed the relationship between Western citizens and their national governments. For citizens to reclaim power, they must not only embrace the basics of free markets once again, but also rekindle a fondness for questioning the motivations of political authorities. You can't just bow down and say you must obey the government. Because, in essence, the government is us in the United States. Those that are performing their offices and duties are not our leaders. They are our representatives. It is a representative form of government. And somehow we have misunderstood that and how our actual hierarchy works. And we must remember the always applicable quote, quote, Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, end quote. And as well known as these words are, the universality of their meaning is often ignored, because it's not just kings and generals and popes who possess great power. A person, group, or institution is also capable, through enticement, let's say, coercion or brute force, of bending an individual's free will. The structures and instruments of power exist. A local school board, after all, may well have been more immediate and intimate influences over a person's family than the United Nations Human Rights Council and its revolving door of despots who tend to promulgate international resolutions shielding their own crimes. Yes, an actual school board might be the thing that is really creating havoc among your community. But a wealthy landowner like, let's say, Bill Gates, who exerts hefty influence over agricultural or cattle markets, influences the pocketbook fortunes of more modest farmers, too. As well, the small number of multinational corporations that control most television and print news sources around the globe also control the sociological levers capable of manufacturing or shifting completely public opinion. So, power in any form political, economic, cultural, or religious, is an abiding challenge to human liberty, and in this way, must always be guarded against as a potential foe. Albert Camus stated, The welfare of the people has always been the alibi of tyrants, end quote. So the great mass murderers of the 20th century also attest to this truth. Lenin, let's say, Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, and Mao killed tens of millions. But they did so, they assured the world, not for their own glory, but for the benefit of the people. Fidel Castro and Guevara 
executed tens of thousands of political prisoners while absurdly claiming that they did so in the name of freedom. Once again, you'll see this Rousseauian concept continue throughout history. And T.S. Eliot said this, quote, Most of the evil in this world is done by people with good intentions, end quote. So when people or institutions wrap themselves in the garments of good intentions and proclaim loudly to be working for the people's best interests, that is precisely the time when individual liberty is most at risk. So today in the West, we are confronted with an uncomfortable paradox. And at the same time, as national leaders defend vague notions of democracy against authoritarian threats beyond their borders, power and influence continue to rapidly amalgamate into the hands of just a small few. So it's no secret that money influences politics. It also influences religion. It influences everything. So no matter how profusely politicians may assert their civic independence from lobbyists and benefactors filling their campaigns or war chests, they are influenced. The same goes for ministries and parachurch ministries that keep on telling themselves the lie that, let's say, quote, I will just take this money for a little while, end quote, or, quote, all money is God's money and most of this money will go for good work, end quote while taking millions from Riotti, Lilly, Kern, Chan, Singer, Soros, and with many others who are committed to this Great Reset. So with organizations such as the World Economic Forum openly working to direct the legislative programs and executive actions of nation-states across the globe, however, wealthy patrons of elite economic societies have become increasingly vocal about their ambitions towards remaking the world according to their own Great Reset designs, while flexing their political muscles within the domestic affairs of discrete nation-states for ordinary citizens to see. And so, then you have Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. And so, there was this clip that's been going around the internet quite a bit over the last year, and this is where Klaus Schwab was appearing with David Gergen back in 2017 at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, and openly boasting of his influence over many national leaders. And he said this, quote, and this is Klaus Schwab saying this, quote, I have to say when I mention names like Mrs. Merkel or even Vladimir Putin and so on, they have all been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. But what we are really proud of now is the young generation like Prime Minister Trudeau, the President of Argentina, and so on. So we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday, I was at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau, and I know that half of his cabinet, or even more, are young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. It is true in Argentina, and it is true in France now. End quote. So you have this man, Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, who's bragging of penetrating all the cabinets of the governments of these young global leaders of which we have many in the United States, including some Republicans, including Ben Crenshaw and Adam Kinzinger. So when the chairman of an international economic body publicly brags about his leverage over the leaders of sovereign nation states, well you have to start thinking the unthinkable. That we are under a full state of both an invasion and an insurrection. An inside and outside attack. Both of propaganda, re-education, of mass psychosis, and with the enemy of our nation destroying our infrastructure and attempting to replace it with their systems. Because that is what's happening. Now, we have been talking about this for over two years, but in a somewhat obvious display of the World Economic Forum's control over individual nations, it has become eerily commonplace these last two years to hear the leaders of the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States all parroting the exact same Build 
Back Better slogan propagated by Klaus Schwab's Economic Club. So with wealth and political power bonded densely into really very obvious cabals, the insular prerogatives of the WEF have succeeded in dominating government policies throughout the West, both in their immediate handling of the COVID-19 pandemic and their planned response to the harsh economic repercussions dovetailing from their strategic prolonged lockdowns. And Western nation states have taken many of their cues directly from the World Economic Forum's policy edicts. Whatever vestige of democracy still casts a shadow across North America, Europe, and South and the South Pacific, it really has become unmistakable that what we're watching is a plutocracy ruled by a wealthy elite. And it's fast assuming total control over the West future. While it may be a plutocracy at the top, it is more of an enviro-communo-fascist model in the actual workings of the implementation of the new systems over the new obedient serf class, which would be us. So the World Economic Forum, for instance, demands governments take urgent action to combat or address climate change, cybersecurity, online misinformation, artificial intelligence, overpopulation, the use of hydrocarbon energy, farm ownership, food supplies, the elimination of private vehicle ownership, how someone should worship or not worship and what they should be concerned about, and the imposition of citizen-controlled protocols to defend against future pandemics. It is the regulation and control of people, movement, and of markets, which is now the paramount importance to those associated with the World Economic Forum and their partner governments. So when the uber elite at BlackRock, Vanguard, and the World Economic Forum successfully influence politicians to enact laws that benefit their personal financial interests, a corrupt practice known as regulatory capture. In other words, they distort the normal dynamics of any free market. And so when governments mandate more expensive forms of clean energy across the market, for instance, Wealthy corporations capable of enduring these added costs reap the ancillary benefits of gobbling up the market share abandoned by smaller competitors unable to survive. This is by design. This is strategic. And this is why this is happening. And so, by utilizing law and regulation as a sword and shield to prevent potential competitors from entering the market while expanding monopoly power, these fascistic plutocrats use political patronage and fashionable policy goals disguising self-interest to maintain their own wealth and control. And so, climate change, public health, sustainable food supplies, the public policy issue is never anything more than an expedient lever for the wealthiest in the West to use cynically in an effort to maintain economic control. So this fusion between the wealthiest elites like Larry Fink, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Paul Singer, and government power has created a type of reverse fascism. Instead of some charismatic political leader in the mold of Benito Mussolini demanding that titans of industry follow his commands for the benefit of the state and the interests of the people, you now have this new class of plutocrats, who, yeah, by the way, they all admire Marcus, Marx, and Mao, that now steer the direction of national policies and pay the politicians to make sure the people will comply. So the plutocrats associated with the World Economic Forum take a nearly identical position as traditional communists, traditional Marxists, in asserting that the economic pie is only so big and can therefore only be divided among a growing population in smaller and smaller portions, but never actually enlarged. Again, we are going from an on-demand economy to a scarcity economy. That is what you are experiencing. And so, when economic wealth is seen as finite, preventing others from acquiring personal prosperity is necessary for maintaining political power's status quo. But, when market competition is permitted to grow wealth in perpetuity, 
not only does a growing share of the population increase its wealth, but also political power becomes spread out more diffusely. So when a, the rising tide of free markets is allowed to lift all boats, right? You've heard that a million times. Neither the plutocrat nor the communist Politburo holds as much sway. And so both the old-style Marxist communists and the neo-plutocrats of the World Economic Forum share a similar goal, minimizing the prosperity of the majority of citizens while maximizing the political power of a small minority of government officials. Because under communism, this type of power arrangement takes the form of an oligarchy or rule by a small few. Under the World Economic Forum's brand of oligarchy, where the West's wealthiest manipulate centrally controlled governments, the result is demonstrably plutocratic. For plutocrats, actual free markets are a threat to their habitual control over political power. And so, strategic purpose political interventionism has precipitated a Western energy crisis. It is a created crisis for a purpose. Regulatory agencies and taxing authorities claim jurisdiction over every element of industry, production, and product distribution. And so tens of thousands of new laws, rules, and regulations make it nearly impossible for any entrepreneur to navigate markets without inadvertently committing infractions or becoming a future target of an ever-growing army of regulatory code enforcers. Citizens are taxed on their wages, incomes, purchases, property, investments, improvements, sales, etc. And should they still possess anything of worth upon their ultimate demise, some agent of the state is likely to take one final cut of their bequeathed estates. And the same unit of labor is then taxed repeatedly along the government's conveyor belt of confiscation. And so in an age of rampant political correctness and woke cancel culture, indoctrination and political dogma have supplanted basic education. That's what's been happening in our schools and in our churches. So math, science, history, and philosophy have been watered down to make room for ideological fluff, often meant to divide students against one another. And so the combined effect of all this government-sponsored malfeasance has been that intergenerational social mobility in the United States, once impressively robust, by the way, many years ago, has absolutely plummeted. The United States, ladies and gentlemen, is being disrupted and dismantled. We are being torn apart. The United Kingdom is being torn apart. France is being torn apart. Canada is being torn into pieces all at the same time. But what nation is growing stronger? Well, it's China, a key partner with the World Economic Forum. But all of this isn't even the worst of what is actually happening. Because yes, we are being ushered into an enviro-communo-fascistic system that will destroy the West and give rise to the tyranny of China. And America will be diminished if we don't wrestle back control very soon. But the worst of this is that this never stops. Because that's the nature of the dialectic. Because the World Economic Forum is not just after our economy. They aren't just after our national sovereignty. They're coming for your cognitive liberty. For your very thoughts for your dreams, for the fortress of ideas and thoughts that you keep guarded behind your cranium as they build their technocratic god in their own image. They will seek to be your Holy Spirit, to be your conscience, to ensure that you will approach everything in your old life with a critical consciousness. This is the future for, for your children and for your grandchildren. That is, unless we rise to stop this, 
unless we rise to inform our fellow citizens, unless we rise to take back the levers of power, unless we hold the corporations responsible for their treachery, unless we flush all of the pastors of the World Economic Forum out of their pulpits, unless we clear our schools of the Marxists and Gnostics, we must do this and we must do this now because we must win. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic.